you got to have your operations tight. Like I wouldn't have a 16 unit in one city and a 12 unit in another. I, I, for me, that wouldn't work. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Tom Henderson. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty fantastic. How about you, Todd? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for joining me. And uh, Tom, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself to, to the listeners. But before you do that, what's one thing that gets you up and excited every single day? Um, just my 18-month-old girl providing a better present and future for her and my beautiful wife, Bianca. Oh man, that that's what an answer there. You, now you're gonna have to play this for 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 them. I guess the 18 months will be like, wow, I don't even know what that means. But uh, making deposits, Todd. Making yeah, deposits. yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, and you're grateful, and that's that's huge, right? Being being just grateful for what you have. So, all right, why don't you give our listeners a bit more, uh, a bit about your background, and then we'll dive in. Excellent. So, um, I still actually work a full time job, and I'm very excited to be working a full time job. Um, I'm senior director uh, for a company called Zscaler. We're in a cloud security business. And over the last 12 years, though, we've built a side hustle, a real estate company. Now we have 82 units in a very small subsection of Minneapolis. So I've been doing that every year for the last 12, 13 years and, you know, selling software and services full time. So let's talk about balancing a full-time job and real estate. Because a lot of people are going, hey, I like my, there's a lot of people I talk to that really like their jobs, and but they want to start investing in real estate. They want to start doing something else. So let's talk about that. How, do, how are you balancing your job, making sure you're still good and effective at your job so you don't get fired, all right? Because you like it uh, and still actually able to do this side hustle, which I would call it, you know, yeah, still, I guess it's a side hustle, but man, you know, how many units you have, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, well, we can do better there. Um, but, it, it, you know, my, my wife now, it's her full-time job. So she's a full-time real estate investor, you know, per the guidelines. So that's been really helpful. And it, and it is a lot of work. Um, but I'd say time management is crucial. And backing in that time management is understanding, like, what your job is. What are your priorities to do your job? So what's your vision? What's your strategy? execution and metrics for your job and then saying no to a lot outside of that hmm. and um, early on in my career a lot of happy hours a lot of networking and I think a lot of a fluff but it was good to build a network um and as I've gotten older and as we had kids I had a kid gotten busier just learning how to say no right and as we're coming out of this pandemic my travel is picking up again it's learning how to say no what's good work and get everyone around you in the workplace on the vision of like what good work is, um, whether it's, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, you can still do something outside of that for sure. Um, but just be efficient and effective and prioritize is, is the key thing. And, and that's in my mind as well. Let's dive deeper into that because uh, obviously very critical whether you're working a full-time job or not. You know, I, yeah. I don't work a full, I don't work a real job. I haven't for many years, but time management, prioritization, super important. Any specific things you and your wife do in order to be more effective and efficient uh, with your time, with how you're showing up every day? Yeah. So um, we know what our values are first yeah. off. And we've written that down and we talk about it. And if, and if things don't align with our values, we just don't do it. Mm. And, it and it clarifies a lot. So that's, I guess, for our family vision. Um, we talk every week on, you know, like on a weekend, you know, what's going on with the buildings? How are we doing? What do collections look like? What repairs are in place? Uh, who's late? You know, it's getting, it's getting easier out of the pandemic because the eviction moratoriums are, ending, you know, we can actually operate our business as a business. And the last couple of years have been really messy between Rent Health Minnesota and uh, chasing tenants and tenants not wanting to pay because they know that even though they could get free rent, that they couldn't get evicted. So that was a challenge. But right now we're getting into 
the, the market, I think, is equalizing and that, that lends itself to an operating rhythm. So that's her job. Um, she does that two days a week. And then, you know, she's a mom two days, two and a half days a week. So um, getting into a rhythm and having that communication. And if I look at the traction model, like she's the, the integrator and that's a super important role where I'm more of the visionary. And I was the integrator when we built this thing. Um, earlier on in my career, I'd sell services or software full time. And when I had a, a territory rep job, I wasn't traveling as much, but my roommate was a contractor. He paid his rent. He's one of my best friends. He paid his rent and labor. Hmm. So I was able to get more out of life when I didn't have all the responsibilities. And as the responsibilities and obligations have come with marriage and a kid, uh, just focus, prioritization, communication. Things don't align to values. We don't do it. But then really letting her do her thing. And I do my thing. And then we talk on the weekends and then we repeat. So it's actually kind of boring. You know, is that, is that a good enough thought? <laughs> yeah. Well, boring sometimes is actually really good. Like your business should not be, you maybe can love it, but it shouldn't be too exciting. It shouldn't be too extravagant. If it's, if it's too wild and crazy, you're going to get burned out. So, so creating a boring business is, is perfect. Sometimes I get people that want to like watch what I do. Like, Hey, can I just like come over and hang out with you and see what you do every day? And I'm like, that would be so freaking boring. Like I enjoy it, but you'd just be watching me like do not exciting things. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really, you know, it's really not as boring as beautiful. Yeah. Um, and if you want to talk exciting, we can talk about the time uh, a tenant burned my sixplex down or, you know, we had a tenant crash through um, or someone crashed through a retaining wall, someone crashing to a six, another sixplex. Like we can have those discussions, but I, I kind of just like operating at this point, Yeah. you know, we had, and uh, that's where we're at. Are you guys self-managing or is that hired out? Uh, we manage it. Uh, we have a, uh, a property manager. We hire it out. And we have a weekly call with our property manager, actually. Yep. And it works really well. Love it. Love it. Let's, um, I want to talk about, because you're buying right now, correct? You guys are still buying? Yeah, we've been buying for the last two years. We've been, we've been trading up quite a bit. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing to find deals? I, I think that's, uh, this is kind of fun. What you guys have done to find deals and get these things closed. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of ways to find deals and, and everyone, you know, a lot of the real estate thought leaders and they're right. They talk about metrics and they talk about activity and they talk about your deal hound and this and that. And uh, that's, that's probably the best way. The other way is, you know, you catch the deals from the brokers and that's, that's a great way, but you're often getting the deals after they've already shopped them silently. Um, we, we, we've purchased via brokers before we've purchased via MLS, but right now we're doing the majority of our acquisitions off market via someone um, that has kind of mentored us over the years. So uh, we want him to make as much money as he can. Uh, we want a fair, you know, deal. Um, but we, you know, we have a non-disclosure agreement already in place. We have contracts or we have, you know, templates already in place. So it really makes the buying process easy that we can go make money, save money. And when he's ready to offload another building, give him a fair market value and we don't have to compete. So that's, that's what we've been doing the last couple of years. Yeah. And I want my listeners to understand what you're saying. Um, so what, what Tom did is created a relationship with an owner that has a decent amount of properties. Um, uh, are they all or, or many of those properties at least are in your target area? Yep. Uh, and through that relationship, he's again, it's it, this isn't Tom, this wasn't overnight. How long have you known this person? Um, I met him at a party at a, at a, at a pork grilling competition in 2011, <laughs> and it wasn't until 2021 that we actually started buying. Yeah. So there was 10 years of you know ongoing relationship building. You know, we'd catch up maybe a year or two had passed, you know, and, and that's okay. But just, um, when was the first time you told him you wanted to buy his properties? Does he, does he known it for a while? It actually didn't, didn't 
start that way. I, uh, I asked them to look at a 29 unit I was thinking about um, in another part of town um, on Grand Avenue. Um, that's before the rent control went in place. But I asked them to, <laughs> to look at this and, you know, hey, here's what I think I could do. I'm ready for this. And he's just like, well, why wouldn't you buy some of my stuff? And I'm like, well, let's let's talk. So that's where that the genesis of that came from was having them look at a deal. Um, and, and it was natural that way. You know, he would always say like you know, there's a lot of guys or a lot of gals coming to me, they want mentorship and then there's no follow up. That's so that's that was something I learned. But the other thing was just be cool with people. And there was never any like pressure, like, hey, I need to buy these from you. It was like, hey, I need your help. And this is, and then when you realize I was in a position to actually pull the trigger, it, it actually worked out with what he's doing in his life with his timing. So I think there's a key thing you said right there about mentorship is, is following through, right? As a lot of people want people to help them, uh, or they think they want people to help them, they want advice, but then they don't follow through. You know, if somebody's going to give you good advice and some, some things you should do, go do them, take that advice and actually do something with it. Otherwise they're not going to want to talk to you again. Right. They're not, or, or they're yeah. not, not necessarily not going to want to talk to you, but they're not going to want to continue to give advice to you if you're not doing anything. Yeah. I mean, he said that he has a lunch with, um, you know, a prospective mentee once a month, at least he's always, because it's in our best interest in the twin cities to create a market and a network of owners, you know, we can work together uh, on, on issues. Yeah. So he's always investing into the community. Um, but there's been very, like he said, people just don't take action and that's fine, but taking action, you know, for me in 2011 started with a duplex and he actually went and looked at that duplex, uh, in uptown. And, uh, we just kept the relationship going and it was natural. Never, never really wanted things outside of knowledge and experience. And that's what you look for in a, mentor is a short, you know, it's basically a shortcut to mastery. That's the only way I think you can get there. Hey, the North Star Real Estate Conference is back. It's May 2nd and 3rd, and this year it's a bit different. We're gonna be hammering in on multifamily real estate, and we're gonna show you asset management, value add strategies, raising millions of dollars through syndication, and how to find those hidden gems in today's market that are just so tough to find. And one of the biggest things I'm excited to bring you is industry experts that you're gonna be able to put on your team so you can hit the ground running day one. So join us May 2nd and 3rd at the North Star Real Estate Conference. I look forward to seeing you there. You guys are buying um, some of these assets from, from this uh relationship that you've built throughout the years, uh, you know, before, and, and I've known this through previous conversations with you, but you guys are slow playing. You're not aggressively trying to buy everything from this guy. You're just doing it as he's ready to sell. Right. And, and, and there's no pressure there. It sounds like. Yeah, it's, that's it. It's no pressure. Um, I don't need to have 2000 assets under management tomorrow. Uh, you know, my game is in syndication. My game is building our own personal business with my wife. And, you know, and, and we think long-term we're looking at 15 years out and, you know, this is you know, our 401k. This is our full-time job. So that's the way we look at it. And, you know, that's just our play. And it's not to say others are, you know, ours is better or worse. It's just, this is what we're doing right now. And we have the rhythm going. Tom, you guys did a development recently. Uh, how's that going? Uh, it's done. Uh, so did you sell it? No, I think we're going to hold it. You know, the, hold we, it. Did what we, we did what you should never do is you fall in love with a piece <laughs> of property. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you know, that's, you never want to get emotional, but you know, this was the first, I think we've done probably between unit flips and, I think we've done 30 to 40 full-time guts and flips over the years. And mm -hmm. that's probably my, you know, just peanuts compared to like a lot of people, but for people working a full-time job, well, I was going to say for, for working a full-time job, yeah. that's, that's solid. Yeah. So we bought a, um, you know, this was my first duplex and it was, we, I mean, I bought it in 2011 for like uh, 126,000. And that was all I could afford mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and it was, you know, FHA first time I did it. My first building was an FHA 203K. So yep. we so actually lived in this one. I lived in it and we financed it. I financed it with, you know, the, the development or the construction yep. with yep. the bank's money. And it was like, it was terrifying. And 5,000 bucks to my name, you know, it was my first job selling, 
trying to sell stuff and thinking I just can't get fired. I'm on a probationary period here for the first six, <laughs> six months. And, you know, I take 4,000 of it and it goes into this funnel. And man, I felt like uh, they knew more about me than my doctors did the, the mortgage underwriters from Wells Fargo, but we ended up selling that building. Um, a good, I think six, seven years later, and we bought a fourplex on the university of Minnesota, right off side of the campus and with a non-conforming side lot. And the fourplex was just a, phen- it's a phenomenal building. They're all one bed, one bath, but I bought it for the land and the zoning at the time wouldn't let me create uh, any, you know, anything, but I knew that there was a 2040 high density plan coming. And I knew that, you know, the 1031 money could afford this and another building. And I just needed to wait and be patient. And it took two years to get it approved. We, you know, invest the 20 K with an architect and hmm. consultant and, and we got a duplex and we built a duplex that um, has four beds and two baths up and down. And it's just a great, efficient building. And so now we have the valuation of a sixplex. So, um, like I said, everything is for sale at the right price. Uh, but this one is a special little building. But if we found uh, the right deal, we'd have no issue 1031 in this. But it's cool to buy something under four unit money. But all of a sudden you have six unit valuation, but really it's worth like a 12 flex because of, you know, what we did in it. But, yeah, and that's cool because that wasn't one of my best friends first projects building it. And then my wife ran the entire thing. And it was like the first time I felt like I didn't have to do anything. And the business was building itself, you know? Yeah. That's really cool. Look, take, take risks, right? I mean, you had a brand new job, you got 5k to your name and you go buy this duplex. You probably really had no business buying it, but you were willing to take that risk and it worked out. And, and then you took that duplex, turned it into now a six plex, brand new, brand new building, uh, or one brand new building. And it's my guess worth a couple bucks more than that original duplex that you purchased. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, you know, we can value it differently. We don't, we're not valuing it off of comps. We're valuing it off of net operating income and because, of where it's located and the rents I'm able to get yeah. and four beds, two baths and that little, that duplex is performing like an eight unit. And that, you know, it just, it's, but it's, I mean, it's, um, I would love to do more of that in the future. Cause I think that's a, there's a little bit of arbitrage there. And yep. if we, if we listed it, I think it would go within a day. It's it just, it's just a great building. So. Yeah. What are some lessons that you guys learned with the, uh, with the development uh, play that you did? Um, I think having a great architect and paying for that is, is worth its weight in gold. Like that's, that's just money. Um, like don't try to do that yourself. Don't try to hire a draftsman and shortcut that process because yeah. the architect knows the city planners and they have the relationships and they can shepherd something through. Oh, so and, valuable. Isn't that yeah. Funny? Yeah. That's money. Um, yeah. I think uh, having a great property manager because you want to have full occupancy in the other building while the next door is just a mess that has great communication skills and can communicate like, this is what's happening, but here's what we're doing for you to deal with this is, was huge. Um, I think those are the two things that I also think, you know, don't be afraid to buy something just because it's zoned in properly. Know what's coming down the, you know, the pike with yeah. uh, the city council, what the politics are in the region, what the, what the vision is. Um, and, you know, I remember sitting at the closing table and the, and the person that sold it to me was just like, yeah, well, we've owned it for 30 years and we've tried uh, don't think you're going to be able to do anything with it, but you know, we wish you the best and they're sincere, but I'm sure they've driven by and they're like, dang it. But uh, it was a fair deal and they got a, they got a fair market value, but we've just taken it and run with it. So. Yeah. Like you said, you got to know where you're buying and understand what their, what the city's vision is. You know, you went to bought that in some third ring suburb or some rural town that had zero zero vision to have higher density. Um, but uh, not that you wouldn't have bought it. You wouldn't have bought it thinking that th- there's a potential development though. But here in Minneapolis, you saw the vision, you knew that they wanted higher density and that made a lot of sense. Maybe the deal worked without it, but it worked yeah, but, better with it. And what I didn't share is that I actually came in second on a 16 unit and that's where the money was originally going to go. Mm. Um, and then ultimately that uh, person who was ahead of me ended up 
um, retrading the deal. Like they got cold feet upon, you know, the inspection report, this and that. So I took the money that was allocated for that. They liked the other offer more. And so I had to pivot because I had a time window and I bought this and I bought a single family and I was thinking they're trade bait. Like here, there's value here. But ultimately they ended up retrading out of that deal. And we went and we ultimately got the 16 unit too. And I had to bring in a partner on that. So uh, it, all came full, it so all came full circle. <laughs> so I got, I got all deals and, you know, yeah. and, uh, mm-hmm. and grateful we got the 16 unit. That thing is, you know, that's, that's it's, it's so easy to operate that. And, I, and the sellers did a great job uh, on that. You know, the, it, it, all the value that was already done, but based on what the, the timing in the market, it's already done great. And then we've already been able to increase the value here and single family home. We've already 1031 that into something. So, uh, Tom, I, I talk to a lot of guys and gals who are owning 100, 200, 300 unit properties. Uh, that's mostly what I own. But you are buying, you know, 16 units. You're buying 20 units. You're buying, you know, kind of that mid, mid-sized mid property. What are some of the benefits? What are what are some of the things that you like about the proper, those properties? And then maybe what are maybe what you think are maybe some disadvantage of those properties? Yeah. So you got to have your operations tight. Like I wouldn't have a 16 unit in one city and a 12 unit in another. I, I, for me, that wouldn't work, but they're all within a mile radius and our the property manager specializes in that part of town. And so we have, you know, it's like a cluster. If you think about that. Um, so you've got these 82 uh, or whatever you said at the beginning, 82 ish units all pretty close to each other. They're all in the same general neighborhood. Yeah, they're all in the same general neighborhood. You can drive um, drive to them within five minutes a piece, each one. Right. So, right. Uh, it's a loop. Um, look, there's there's probably better ways to do it, but you also got to be realistic too. Like most people just can't come out on, on their own dime by a hundred unit building. Um, you got you to gotta work its way up. And I think, um, and I would recommend to someone to start with a duplex and see if you actually like it. And then trade up. Um, would it be nice to be in a hundred unit uh, with an in you know a person that lives there, a caretaker? Absolutely. But um, the the other thing too is there's less there's typically less competition for this. Yeah. Um, more of the institutional money likes the big, um, easy easier to operate. Although it's that's my own opinion. So I still think there's value here. Um, and where I live, a lot of it it's owned by mom and pop. Um, the person I'm buying from is not a mom and pop. But I still think there's opportunity there to stay under the radar and build value. So that's just my perspective. Yeah, like it. Well, you're 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 right. I mean, if you want, especially your strategy right now is not to do a syndication, and for you to come in and you to be buying a, a bunch of buildings that are 100, 200, 300 units, you can't really do that. And so if you're like Tom and you go, Hey, I don't, I don't want to do a syndication. I know a lot of people that have zero interest in that Buy those small buildings. But I like that strategy that you've created where you're buying them in a cluster. You're very focused. Most people aren't very focused. Most people are going, I got a good deal. It's in Minneapolis. I got a good deal. It's in St. Paul. I got a good deal. It's, you know, two and a half hours away from me in some random tie. I talk to a lot of people that are looking at some random deal in Northern Minnesota or, you know, down in Iowa. And they're like, Hey, what do you think? And I'm going, that's crazy. You know, why, why are you buying that building? It doesn't make any sense for you, but you've really folk laser focused on a general area. And it sounds like it served you pretty well. Are there any disadvantages that you would say, man, it sure would be great to have a bigger building or anything that you see as a, as a downfall? Um, a bigger building would always be better, but you also got to act prudently when you're an investor and, you know, you're, you're building your own family office and just make, you know, do the moves you can be aggressive, but also, you know, don't expose yourself. Hmm. Um, someday if I'm, if I'm not working a full-time job, yeah, I'd love to do and put together a syndication, but I don't feel like I can actually give those investors attention because I have a full-time focus. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I just want to always do a good job by whomever I'm, you know, working with, whether it's the company that I work with and I have to focus on it or 
uh, investors because investor, I mean, you, you owe the bank. That's your bank, right? Yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good point, and and I commend you for that. Is you're working a full time job, your focus is on your company that you're working for, and if you start taking on a lot of investors, now you're focusing on two different things. And how do you give full effort to your investors while full effort to your full-time job? That becomes a, a juggling act. And now your your wife is working with you. So maybe that works, but um, that it definitely, it definitely adds a, a layer of complexity into it. So I commend you for, um, you know, just, just being true to what you are trying to do and, and not doing what everybody else is doing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the syndication business model is awesome. I, I know a lot of people that have created a lot of wealth for their investors and for their families. Um, and maybe someday, you know, we'll be able to do it and we'll definitely be able to market it. And we have, I mean, we have, I've had so many people approach me about investing with me, but I've typically just turned them away. Yeah. Um, and, and that's fine too. Uh, but uh, I think long-term it'll work out. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. What's a what's one of the mistakes that that you guys have made, and how have you learned from? How can you teach the audience um, from a mistake that you made? Um, one of the mistakes that we made is, uh, you know, when we started, I was in Uptown in Minneapolis, and then I owned a fourplex in Northeast Minneapolis, and I bought a duplex on the west side of St. Paul, and I really stretched my property manager. Um, and that's, I think I, we found just, the, we have the best property manager. Um, I'm not going to say who he is or yeah, who he yeah. works for because I want to keep that to myself. <laughs> you know, I also want to be a good business partner and being a good business partner is respecting what their scope is and not expecting just because your business partners expect you to do that. Yeah. Maybe I was pushing their limits a little bit because they're not a big shop. Um, and it just focused us, right? Um and as I look back, we, you know, I sold, I think we sold 10, 20 buildings and we could have made money had we held on to them, but I don't regret any of the, the decisions we made. Did we sell great buildings? I could have appreciated six figures, uh, all of them, but did we trade and make money with them? Yeah. So I, I just think when you're working with your own money, you, some days you gotta, you gotta shoot your horse and you gotta trade it into something else and, and you just make good capital allocation decisions. So Tom, knowing what you know now, let's just, I, I, I know there's people listening to this are like, man, this, uh, this, uh, this guy resonates with me. Like everything he says is spot on. I'm in the same shoes as him, but I want to get to where he's at. I'm not even close. So take yourself back with what you know today, with what you've done already, take yourself back to before you bought any properties what are maybe what what are some words of wisdom words of advice maybe two or three things people can really do to launch themselves on the success that you have seen so far yeah oh, well, i don't know if we call ourselves successful or not we're just but we're i'll call you successful so uh, I, I think the biggest thing todd is just getting started and i think a lot of people read all the real estate books and there's some great books out there and they want all the answers, but there's no substitute for 10,000 hours of in the grind process. Yeah, and I look at that like 10,000 hours is typically the amount of time someone it takes for someone to master something. Like that's what the advice is. Yeah. So um, I'd say like you can't master something if you're learning about it, you have to learn in it. And so I would say like, look, if you don't have the capital and all you can afford is a duplex or a single family just start there and you have to let time do its work because we've been at this 10 years so that's twenty thousand hours of part-time work and now my wife is doing it um and i would just say getting started is number one um and not being afraid to strike up a partnership like we do have a partnership on one building and a minority partner on a small on a small minority partner on another one and a joint venture can be really good because you can help people achieve your goal, their goals. But the people that don't start, you can't time the real estate market. You really don't have control. And it's, and it's more, I mean, my personal opinion 
is that it's not like liquid, like the stock market. You don't have the highs, you don't have the lows. And I don't think we're going to see a 2008 again for a long time because the mortgages are just good today and the underwriting is good. So I think just start and uh, get going. Yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. I, there's a lot of people that just want to read, they want to listen to all the podcasts, they want to go to all the conferences, they want to do all that, and they never push that start button. And if you're not in the grind, if you're actually not boots on the ground, you're not going to learn everything you need. So I I 100% agree. Just go ahead and start with the duplex. Or hey, look, if you're trying to if you want to be a syndicator, well then find a syndicator and just figure out what you can do for them. Whatever it takes you just got to get in the corridor. Yeah. I'd say if you're not married, um, I, I would work weekends and nights because you don't have obligations and try to cram as much work as you can in that period of time. Mm -hmm. And if you are married, you know, have a common vision and work toward that and you can work a little bit. And I would say, don't get paralyzed by the legal lease out there. Like, do I need an LLC or not? Like, it, it, it doesn't matter. But when you buy a building under four, buy it under your personal name and get yourself an umbrella policy. Uh, but like, don't get paralyzed by what the people who get paid for professional services say. Have good representation and move forward. Yeah, love it. Love it. Take action. All right couple last questions before I wrap up. One is what's a, what's a book, a favorite book that you can recommend to our listeners? Um, I think mastery by Robert Green. Robert Green is just a phenomenal author and he's, you know, he wrote the 48 laws of power, 33 strategies of war mastery. Um, I mean, he's really good. Um, everyone's going to want to hear rich dad, poor dad. And you know, all that stuff. And that's great, but I would, I would go off a little bit different and do something a little, you know, like Robert Greene is my favorite author is what I would say. Cool. Love it. What do you, how do you like to give back Tom? Uh, I like to give back. Uh, you know, my wife and I are involved with church, which is good. Uh, can be more involved there. And I think, you know, after the pandemic and just looking at really being in person again, um, and you know, I'm, I'm a simple, simple guy and I have two younger brothers. So I think just being present for them um and for my family and uh for my extended family is it's what's important to me love it love it man all right so last question before we wrap what are your three pillars of wealth creation um i'm i'm boring i like working for software companies i like you know having these 1960s built units in northeast minneapolis and um you know we like also just being steady Eddie with financial products as well. So I'm, I'm a boring guy, Todd. Perfect. I love it. I love it, man. Well, cool, Tom. Uh, if our listeners want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Uh, just find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, you know, Tom Henderson. There's, there's a bunch of them, but you can probably hear the accent. I am a Minnesotan. So feel free to reach out and, and uh, happy to help with whatever I can. Cool. Tom, again, really appreciate it. A lot of, a lot of good stuff. I, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation we've had. So you take care. Have a fantastic rest of the day. All right. Later, Todd. Thanks, man. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So, uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So, go on to venturedproperties.com, venturedproperties.com, and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So, I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free, I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, you want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make 
it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.